So we are going to do the 2017 Putnam competition problem B3. Suppose that f of x, which equals the sum from i equals 0 to infinity of c sub i times x to the i, is a power series for which each coefficient, c sub i, is 0 or 1. Show that if f of 2 thirds equals 3 halves, then f of 1 half must be irrational. Now this is a kind of strange problem to approach because f of two-thirds is a weird sum to think about. It's the sum from i equals zero to infinity of c sub i times two-thirds to the power of i. But plugging in two-thirds is going to give us a kind of weird sum and it's going to be hard to get any information out of that function value. There is an alternative way to approach this problem though that simplifies it a lot. And that is to start from f of 1 half. Notice that our problem is phrased as an if then statement. Show that if f of 2 thirds equals 3 halves, then f of 1 half must be irrational. An if then statement is one way to phrase a statement where we say that a implies b. In this case, a is the fact that f of 2 thirds equals 3 halves and b is the fact that f of 1 half must be irrational. a implies b is the same thing as not b implies not a. This is called the contrapositive. And one way that we can prove this original statement is by trying to prove the contrapositive instead. Proof by contradiction is also a related idea here. So we want to start with not b and try to get to not a. In other words, we're going to start by assuming that f of 1 half must be rational. In this case, the reason that proving by contrapositive is useful for us is that f of 1 half is actually a lot easier to decipher than f of 2 thirds. So let's think about what f of 1 half means. That's going to be the sum from i equals 0 to infinity of c sub i times 1 half to the power of i. That's the same thing as 2 to the negative i. What is this sum saying? Well, there's actually another way to interpret this sum, which is that it is the expansion of a particular number in binary. For example, 1 fifth as a decimal fraction is the same thing as point 00110011011 and so on in binary, which is base 2. We can write this, if we're looking at base 2, as 0 times 2 to the negative first plus 0 times 2 to the negative second plus 1 times 2 to the negative third plus 1 times 2 to the negative fourth and so on. And in each case, the coefficients are either 0 or 1. That means that f of 1 half is going to be the binary expansion of some number. But we know that it's the expansion of a rational number. The question is, what information does that give us? If a number is rational, that actually gives us an important piece of information about its expansion in binary. We know that that expansion must be repeating. That's a little easier to realize if we think about the decimal version. If a number is rational, it must have a repeating decimal expansion, as long as we include 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 repeating as a repeating decimal. That means that we're dealing with a repeating binary expansion here as well. And if we're looking at a repeating expansion, that means that there must be some sequence in here that repeats over and over again. In this case, 1 fifth is a rational number. The sequence that's repeating is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. This sequence right here, 0, 0, 1, 1, is going to get repeated in an infinite number of times. So let's try to rewrite our sum in terms of this repeating sequence here. The first thing that we have to note is that this repeating sequence might not be the first thing that comes up in the expansion. For example, if we were looking at 1 tenth instead of 1 fifth, we would have this extra zero on the front. That means it's possible for, for example, from i equals 0 to n minus 1, for us to have 
an arbitrary terminating sequence of digits that we're adding to our repeating part. From here, we need to think about how we can represent this repeating sequence of digits. In order to do that, let's think about how we can actually express the sequence of digits itself, in this case, 0011. How could we express that sequence? In order to do that, let's first say that the sequence has length m. So in this case, 0011, the length is 4, so we would have m equals 4. We can take the sum from, let's say, k equals 0 to m minus 1. So we have m digits in this sequence. And here we want to represent this sequence of digits. Remember that this sequence is going to start whenever the terminating expansion ends. So in this case, the terminating expansion ends at n minus 1. So the repeating part is going to start at n. So we take c sub n plus k. That's going to give us n, n plus 1, n plus 2, all the way up until that last point after length m. Then we multiply again by 2 to the negative k to make sure that all of these digits are in the correct order. But this is only telling us the sequence of digits that we're looking at. In the case of 1 fifth or 1 tenth, that's 0.011. But this doesn't tell us what an infinite sequence of those looks like. Well, when we have an infinite sequence of digits in an expansion, remember that we can also think about that as a sum. 0.0011 plus 0.0000011 plus, and so on, we add those all up. That's going to look like the sum from i equals 0 to infinity of well, what does it mean to move four places over in a particular expansion? Well, moving one place over corresponds to multiplying by two to the negative first power, or one half. In decimal, it would be multiplying by one tenth, but we're in binary, so we multiply by one half each time. In the case of one fifth, because the length of the sequence is four, every time we're going to move over four digits. But in the case of a sequence with length m, we're going to move m digits over. So we multiply by 2 to the negative m each time. And then that's raised to the power of i, because we're looking at a geometric sum each time we move over that distance. There's one final thing we need to do, which is make sure that our sum actually starts at the correct position in our expansion. Right now, it's going to start right here in the ones place. But remember that we have n digits before that, which are not in our repeating sequence. So this sequence here really needs to be shifted n digits over, which is the same as multiplying by 2 to the negative n. So this is what our binary expansion is going to look like if we assume the opposite, that f of 1 half is rational for the contrapositive. In that case, we have a terminating part and then we have a repeating part represented by an infinite geometric series. This expansion is telling us the way that the coefficients of this power series have to behave for f of 1 half. But this function has fixed coefficients. Those coefficients c sub i are not going to change if we plug in a different input value, which means that this representation, when we're looking at f of 1 half for that binary expansion, must be true for any value that we plug in for x. So what I've written down here is the exact same thing as we plugged in here, except instead of f of 1 half, we're just looking at f of an arbitrary value of x. So anywhere we had 2 to the negative something, we have x to the power of that same thing instead. From here, we can actually go back to our original question, which is what does it mean for f of 2 thirds to equal 3 halves. Because we can look at this expression that we have on the right, our new formulation of f of x, and say, what happens if we plug in f of 2 thirds? Before that, though, we can do one more simplification, which is this part of our expression right here. The sum from i equals 0 to infinity of x to the m raised to the power of i. This is actually just a geometric series because x to the m doesn't depend on i, which means that we can evaluate this part right here 
as one over one minus the common ratio, which is x to the m. Now that we have that out of the way, we're going to evaluate f of two thirds. So this is what happens if we take our function here with the simplified geometric series as one over one minus x to the m and plug in two thirds. In this case, that one over one minus x to the m I've written right here at the front of this rightmost term. Now we need to take a look at the properties of the result that we have right here. In order to do that, I'm going to start by simplifying this fraction that we have a little bit. Because we have 1 minus 2 thirds to the m in the denominator, that's a complex fraction, so it might give us some difficulty. To solve that, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 3 to the power of m. On the top here, we have two different bases, which are 2 and 3. 2 is only being raised to the power of n. So we have 2 to the n. And then we have 3 to the power of m. And then this 3 in the denominator here, raised to the power of n, that's the same as 3 to the negative n. So this is our numerator here. And in the denominator here, 1 times 3 to the m is 3 to the m. And then we have minus the 3 to the m in the numerator and the denominator will cancel out. And that'll just leave us with 2 to the m right here. This is the result that we get when plugging in f of 2 thirds. So let's see if there's any information we can get about this that relates to the value of 3 halves. In order to do that, we need to look at the denominators in each of these expressions. Remember that the coefficients c sub i are either 0 or 1. So they are not going to contribute to any of the fractions. For our first term here, this little sum, we have 2 thirds to the power of i. In that case, we're either going to get 1, which has a denominator of 1, or some power of 2 thirds. So it's going to be a power of 3 in the denominator. 1 and 3 are both odd. When we look at this next section, we have the same deal with this sum on the right side. 2 thirds to the power of k, that's going to have an odd denominator. And right here, we have 3 to the power of m minus 2 to the power of m. Remember, m must be greater than or equal to 1 because we're looking at a repeating decimal length that must be at least 1. Therefore, we have an odd minus an even in the denominator here. And an odd minus an even is going to give us another odd number. For example, 9 minus 4 will be 5, and 5 is odd. That means we have an odd denominator here, here, and here. All of these are odd. On the other hand, the result we're supposed to get is 3 halves. That's an even denominator. If all of these denominators are odd, there's no way that adding up all of these fractions is going to get us something even in the denominator. One way to think about that fact is to remember that even means that a number includes a power of 2 in its prime factorization. So if we're looking at, for example, 3 halves, 2 is even because it is a multiple of 2. But all of the numbers in the denominators of these terms, they are all odd. An odd number does not have any 2s in its prime factorization. So when we take the sum of a bunch of those numbers, say we take 1 third plus 1 fifth plus 1 ninth plus 1 uh, seventeenth, if we do this, the denominators here are 3, 5, 9 is 3 times 3, and then 17. All of these numbers have to be odd because if there were any even numbers in this prime factorization, those numbers would be even as well. When we get a common denominator of all of these, it's going to be 3 times 5 times 3 times 3 times 17. But multiplying a bunch of odd numbers is going to give us another odd number as a result. Therefore, if we add fractions with odd denominators, we must get an odd denominator as a result. Even if we get a whole number, a whole number such as 5 is still 5 over 1 with an odd denominator in reduced form. Therefore, the result that we get from f of 2 thirds, it needs to have an odd denominator, even if it's a whole number. And that means there's no way it can be 3 halves, because 3 halves has an even denominator. It has a 2. There aren't any 2's in any of these denominators, so there's no way we can add them up and get one. That means that if our assumption is correct that we made at the beginning, 
that f of 1 half is irrational, that means that f of 2 thirds cannot be 3 halves. This is the contrapositive of our original statement. If f of 2 thirds equals 3 halves, then f of 1 half must be irrational. Because we've proved the contrapositive, we have therefore proved the original statement, and the problem is solved. So the important thing to take away from this particular problem is that it is very helpful when we get stuck on solving a particular question to consider the problem from a different angle if we can. In this case, that different angle meant we were taking the contrapositive of the statement, which let us look at a different assumption from the beginning. Another thing that we did to view the problem in a different perspective was to think about this sum as a binary expansion for f of 1 half. The way that we apply that for an arbitrary problem is taking our original problem statement, looking at it and thinking, does that remind me of anything else? In this case, when we had c sub i times 2 to the negative i, we said that reminds me of a binary digit expansion, or a decimal expansion, but instead of 10, we had 2. And we can use that idea whenever we're doing problem solving, because often it lets us realize important identities from other areas of math that get us to our solution. Mm -hmm.